You know, I don't know where you stand, but to me, the uh, best Christmas movies have guns. I mean, come on. Uh, Die Hard, A Christmas Story, Fat Man. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. It is here. It is the holiday season. But, you know, it's the holiday season in 2020, so uh, things are a little strange. I'm sure you have heard about this film starring Mel Gibson, Fat Man. I'm excited to talk to the directors. It's the Nelms Brothers. Let's bring them on the show. How are you guys doing? You're in a basement, I understand. In a basement, I yeah. yeah. We've been sequestered to the basement while Ian's family <laughs> runs amok. Oh, my God. Okay, cool. Well, at least, look, I've seen laundry in the background sometimes uh, yeah. when we've done the podcast, so this isn't so bad. We but did a little better than that. <laughs> now, when this trailer, just the trailer for Fat Man hit, it caused controversy, right? <laughs> the movie wasn't even out yet. I remember the trailer hitting, and I'm like, whenever, whenever a lot of people hate a movie, that shoots to the top of my must-see list. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to know, like, where? Because look, truthfully, in my intro, I talk about you know movies about Christmas that have guns. It's a it's a small group. It's Die Hard, A Christmas Story, and your movie. I can't really think of another one that has guns so prominent. But yes. Let's talk about like where this whole project came from. And I also want to talk about getting Mel Gibson involved. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think the original, we've all seen the family friendly Tim Allen version, right? right. We've all seen the uh, sociopath that comes down your chimney, wants to hack up the family with the, with right. the act. So Ian and I were excited because it felt like there was space in the Christmas genre for some <laughs> sort of, for like an everyman sort of thriller-esque action movie. I remember we were just we were just talking to each other uh, a couple days ago about what the first DVD each other bought was, and I remember my the first DVD I ever bought was Unforgiven, and the first one he ever bought was Unbreakable, which I, I which is really interesting because if you kind of smash those two together, it's kind of a Western you know Unbreakable type of vibe, to like a typical superhero. Film. As, as we were thinking about it, we were going, "Damn, I you know it's it's, it's kind of right there." <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's like, to me, like, I don't know, like as a kid, I always like things I probably shouldn't have watched at that age. I think those are the best things. Whenever there was the warning, I was never walking away from a TV that had that warning of like, nope, this is going to be a problem. And I do think that this, I mean, at least for kids of a certain age, this should come with a warning, which means they need to watch it when their parents aren't looking. It's kind of <laughs> how that works. But then how did you like pull together, like Mel Gibson is the key. And the woman um, who plays- uh, Mary, Mary Ann Jean Baptiste. Holy, she's incredible. Yeah, she's um, I love her. So, I mean, killer cast out of the gate, like, you know, but like getting Mel Gibson, like how, how did you swing that one? Like, what do you, what do, you do? Just call him Mel Gibson, talk to his agent, send the material over. What's that process like? Uh, so we obviously are huge Mel Gibson fans since watching Mad Max and eating our Cheerios. Um, Lethal Weapon, obviously, really strong influence. So I think when we we went to go see a screening of Hacksaw Ridge in 2017 ish, and it was during the you know the, the awards you know round circuit and all that stuff. And Mel came out afterwards to do a Q and A, and he had this great big beautiful bushy beard, and he was kind of worn down from the movie and the awards circuit. But he still had that that spark, that fire in his eye. And he was just kneading his beard, talking about making the movie. And he just had that weight of the world on his shoulders. And, man, we were just like, that's the guy. That's that's our Chris right there. And Ian and I came home and just geeked out about it. And that was three years before we actually ended up getting the movie going. So three years later, we're fielding, you know, uh, we're talking to producers. We're talking to financiers. We're talking to studios, stuff like that. It and took us, it took us to, to digress a tiny bit. It took us 14 years to get the movie made. And basically because it was such a batshit crazy tone, people would read it and say, this is awesome. Like, uh, Jesus, like, who, what, like, what is this? And we what go, well, is it? What's, what's right there on the page? And we're like, oh, read it. It's right there. And they were like, I, this is so director dependent. Like, whoever gets their hands on this is going to be doing kind of their thing to it. And it wasn't until we made uh, Small Town Crime, which is our previous film, that we were able to sort of point back. We went into meetings and we said, okay, this is the tone right here. It's this film that we just did before this. We're mixing Western. We're mixing drama, comedy. And we're keeping it very grounded. Action. Yeah, yeah. an action. And that's what, so that was what enabled us. So we were, uh, we were trying to put the movie together. And I remember we get this email 
randomly after we'd submitted it to him and we'd written him a nice letter, you know, but you don't know how long it's going to take. It's, it could be years before that he even reads it or gets it. it. Yeah. And it might've been a couple of weeks since we'd heard anything. So, you know, you kind of write it off after that point. You're like, okay, whatever. I guess we better start thinking of another uh, person to go to. But it's, then we get this email. It says, uh, Hey, I enjoyed the film. Uh, or I enjoyed the script. Uh, I thought it was really funny. Let's sit down for a chin wag. So we and first, like, yeah, well, first of all, we're like, what's a chin wag? <laughs> and then who is this? Because it wasn't like it was signed off like Mel Dude 25. Like yeah, that was right, right. There was no, there were the emails like a moniker. So it didn't, it's not like a, it's not his name or anything. So, and then he didn't sign off. So then I said, okay, great. I thought it was another production company. And I was just like, all right, great. Hey, we're really excited. You know, want to sit down with you and talk about it. But who am I speaking with? And then he's like, oh yeah, sorry. I forget to sign off sometimes. This is Mel. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Oh my God, that's incredible! So they were like, "Where did it go from there?" Our agent, their agent, they were like, "All right, forty-five minutes in this cafe." Over They're like, Mel. "What do you think about coffee with Mel?" We're, we're like, like, "Yes." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we go meet him. It's supposed to be like forty-five minute meeting. Turns into three and a half hours. Yeah. And we're talking about everything. We're talking about his past movies, everything else. We're talking about Fat Man. And it was it was really at this uh, this moment in the conversation that we knew we had the right guys. He starts talking about that scene where he's on the balcony, he's looking out over the elves, and he's got to break this news to them that they have to work with the military. And he said, "I think in that moment, like it's such a it's such a downer of a moment for my character. Like I, I'm so depressed at this point. I think I should be almost ready to cry. I want to feel like real emotions." Yeah, yeah. and we're like, "Yeah, yeah." And he goes, "And that's what's going to be so funny about it." And we're like, "Exactly." <laughs> but that's exactly what we're going for. You know, we he really got the layers, and he really understood how we wanted to ground it. That's so cool. You mentioned um, Hacksaw Ridge. I, I may have been at one of those screenings. No kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I remember it was at, um, I'm part of the CCA, the Critics' Choice uh, Awards. And oh, so cool. I'm fortunate enough to go to some screenings. I don't know how I get in, but whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I got to go to that. And I remember seeing him there. And you are absolutely right. He seemed like he'd gotten, I, I don't know, he just seemed kind of weary. Yeah. yeah. That press tour. I can't imagine, like, it's the only time I actually feel sorry for celebrities is during, like, that award season, like, trying to pitch, like, all these people. It's just like, oh, my God, this has to just be exhausting. Yeah, and so, it's over and over and over. And, Mel, and Mel's so <clears throat> not that guy, right? Like, right. he has a huge passion for the work, but he's, he's not one to go out and self-promote. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's not like that at all. It does disappoint me that I kind of feel like you know, like the Twitter mob will still come after him over stupid shit. I, it really just does annoy me that there's no pathway to redemption for anyone. And so it, that really just bugs me a lot. Clearly we've, you know, you know what I mean? Like he's, he, I, I just feel like they're still after him. Is that like, did you worry about that a little bit when you were casting him at all? Like, did that concern you or anyone? I'll say that we like we tried to we definitely did our homework. Like we we talked to as many people that we knew that had worked with him or that were one person removed of working with him, and we said, hey, you know, we're we're thinking of going into this movie, and we really want Mel for this role. And we said, what do you think? And they said, every one of them said, work with him. You're going to want to work with him. So yeah, well, I mean, Jodie Foster has been yeah. a huge proponent of him and has really stood behind him. I just, you know, look, I, I just feel terrible when you see this happening to, I mean, I have a friend of mine that says, oh, Twitter, that's where celebrities go to apologize. That's, it's mm -hmm. not even a, it's not even a communication platform anymore. But everyone I know that I've spoken to who has worked with him says he's just amazing. I'm just assuming you had the same kind of experience. We did. We had oh. a great experience with him. No, he was, I mean, we had four days in a row in that, that end shootout where we were shooting in negative 36 degrees. And this is just a good example of like what oh my God. he leads by example. <laughs> Dude, we, we took our, so we were, one time we were going through storyboards and stuff and I had my gloves off and you're, and Ian and I made a pact. We're like, no matter how cold it gets, no one will see we're us never going to complain. Shiver. These California <laughs> boys are never going to crack under pressure, even if my foot broke off. And so we're sitting there and I got like, <laughs> The storyboard's out, and it's been about, I don't know, six minutes or so, and we're going through everything with the stunt team. And one of the guys comes up, and your hands, my, my hands went numb 30 seconds after I took my gloves off. But you're just like, keep going. And the guy walks up to me at the grip, and he goes, hey, Ash, you know, he's a local, done a million shows in this now. He goes, just so I want you to know, like, you know, I've seen you had, your, I've timed it, you've had your gloves off for about six minutes, and at eight minutes, 
you're going to start getting uh, irreversible frostbite damage on your hands. So I'm like, I'm going to put those gloves back. Yeah, on. let's go ahead and get some hot. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's how cold it was. It was like miserably cold. And for four days, and I remember when we first started shooting out, they were like, okay, Mel, Mel did a couple takes of something. And then we were like, cut. And I remember we, we said, okay, you're good. Go back to the warming tent, you know, get we're warmed up. We'll see you in like an hour or whatever. And it was somebody else's turn. And we were like, okay, great. And then we turn around 20 minutes later and he's still standing behind us. And we're like, hey, oh, shoot, Mel, hey, you know, like, uh, sorry, you're good to go. Like, you can go back to the warming tent. And he was like, no, 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 no. He's like, I'm, he's like, look, you guys are out here in this shit. I'm out here in this shit. And that was, and he stayed out there for four days in a row. And he was like that for the yeah. whole shoot. And it was just so galvanizing to the rest of the crew. And he wasn't like out there like this. Yeah. And he, we, we were dressed for like, you know, summoning Everest. And he was dressed in his costume with like no finger gloves because he had to work a gun. And like a Carhartt just, jacket, just drinking his green tea, regaling and, everybody on the set. And he would talk to everybody and get everybody jazzed up and hyped up and excited. Actors would come in and out, crew. He's talking to everybody, cameramen, PAs, like and us. Just, Everest fun, man. And just so immensely generous with his knowledge and sharing his stories with anybody that w that would come up and ask him about I mean, something. We were pumping him constantly. What was it like on Apocalypto when you did this on Hacksaw Ridge? How, how about Braveheart? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. At one point, he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, in uh, Braveheart, I, like, double printed some frames for emphasis. And we we're like, oh, double printing frames. Take that like, note. we double printed Ooh. frames in Fat Man. Wow. Well, it just, it, it really, what I also love about the film is the world building that went into it. I don't know, I don't know that others might appreciate this. But what I mean by the world building is the stuff like the, the little inscriptions on all the specific toys and the little rare, like, you know, like the bat or whatever. And then like the other thing with like the elves and the them arguing about diet. And <laughs> the terrible diet. Like, where did all these inspired like choices come from? Like with like to build like a type of, I mean, I just think that, look, I love uh, movies about the holidays. And I feel like when you make one as a filmmaker, you've got like, well, this is always gonna be like, you know, top of mind come the holiday season. And, but you really put a lot into this world building, not only, you know, the character of Chris, right? With Mel Gibson, but all these other little touches that I mentioned. Can can you tell me a little bit about what in, what went into that? I mean, absolutely. And that's that's just come over the years as we thought it out. But I mean, first and foremost, you're dealing with Santa is real, right? He's not some fiscal, fiscal, fictional thing that like nobody believes except the young kids. So that was the first number one rule. And we're like, OK, so if that's real, there's got to be some sort of delineation between normal toys and Chris's toys. And that's when we came up with the badge on the on the toys. And then we had to sort of dive into like what because his power, he is a super, he's kind of a superhero. So we were like, okay, well, what kind of powers would he have? Okay, he's got the omniscient power where he can, he knows when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake. And we were just, and he knows when you've been naughty or nice. Right. And we were like, but how would that work? Because if he had like a billion people going in his brain, he would just be schizophrenic. So we were like, okay, that's what it is. He has to like see you or see your name on a piece of paper on the list. And he's kind of like, oh yeah, Billy Johnson. Okay, yeah, Billy Johnson was good this year. Or, yeah. oh, Billy Johnson. We don't want to get that, you know, like he, 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 he kind of gets a download. Of yeah, he had to be are. in your, his conscious thought. Yeah, so so we as soon as we came up with that, then it was easier to maneuver the hitman and like, okay, well, unless he sees him, if he sees him, then it's like boom, 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 and he can get the whole download of him. But other than that, if that guy stays out of his peripheral and can kind of sneak around and creep around, then he can sneak up on him. And it was it was just things like that. Like when he goes to the bar and you see him have that moment with the trucker and he, he addresses them, says, hey, you know, kind of dresses the guy down and says, you should probably go home to your wife. Like One thing that we'd never seen before was like, when do, like, when do when's the cutoff for getting toys? Right. Right. And like, while it's not explicitly said, it stated in the movie, like we had to come up with that rule. Yeah. So for us, it was like, OK, once you become a teenager, so tw at 12, well, which is Billy's up. age, he never gets another toy after this. This is the last year that he could get one. And then coming up with like we were like, well, there has to be kind of a reason for Santa giving these toys. And so we liked the idea of like it was it was more of like what would you do it was kind of an inspiration yeah. he was like okay this person is if you, you have know, a proclivity towards something has, that cares for people and is you know okay a nurse or a doctor or a, a dental hygienist you know like goes in that order of like he's like okay i'm gonna give the, this guy likes to cook and he's whatever so I, i'm gonna give him an oven and you know like so yeah we had a lot of fun with like like even with skinny man where he gives him that that the car, car. like at mm -hmm. the end holds up it's a police car but the fun thing about that is if you th you think about where he's where he went and what he should have been you know and then that car he's driving is actually the very same make and car of that hot wheel he's holding but it's and it's also a very iconic police car 
So it's a Monaco that was like used in like the original Terminator and stuff like that. So, so it was a double man, a double layer for us. So Skinny Man should be a cop, but he's not. He ended up being a bastard because mm -hmm. of his really bad past and really bad upraising. And I think for us, it was just kind of showing like, I think every kid starts out in a good place and it's like how that kid's raised, what that emotional turmoil that child has to go through can really shape and shift how that kid grows up. And even though he was meant to, could have been a police officer saving lives in the best case scenario, he ended up going way south and going in a bad direction. Yeah. And then we just wanted to give him fun stuff like, like, you know, like, hey, he's going to get injured over all these years. <laughs> right. How is that? Right. right. You know, like, so things, it's just the list, honestly, like we compiled a Word document of like all of Chris's gifts and 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 the universe and that's how we sort of compiled it over the years well it's interesting the, the way you put it it's it's sort of like um you took christopher nolan's approach to batman and we're like <laughs> all right if batman was real also right. a superhero right like like how would batman really work so in a way you kind of took that approach like that like all right santa claus is real we're just gonna you know accept certain types of things about the mythology and then just make it real. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I think it's definitely, what's interesting is it, it fits again, another short list of, I assume it's R rated, right? I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. It, of R rated, you know, Christmas films. It's not a long list. <laughs> how does that, like, how does that feel? There was that, oh, why am I spacing out the, the Billy Bob Thornton uh, Christmas. Um, Bad Santa, right. So it's like with Bad Santa, Fat Man, like you're on this like short list of holiday movies with guns and then like R-rated Christmas films, which I kind of feel like after a while when you watch the sort of heartwarming Christmas films, um, not really in my household, anything outside of the rank and bass stuff, I don't go heartfelt. Uh, but, but like this kind of fits that. And Die Hard really is also like another one of those movies like to watch around the holidays, just be, it's, there's something about it that's more fun. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, look, Ian and I really love those outlier holiday films. That's what, right. that's what we gravitate towards. Now, I think there's I mean, absolutely a place for more traditional family fare and that, that should happen, you know, with the kids around. <laughs> you know? We were like, right, okay, right, right. Bed and put in Fat Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was gonna say, what has been the reaction um, to the film. I mean, unfortunately, you were unable to have like a big premiere. Yeah. Everybody got to attend. But what have been some of the crazy reactions to the film? I remember when I, I interviewed Richard Linklater years ago, and he said that after a while, a lot of the reviews sound the same, like everyone just sort of parrots each other. But then he would always only read the really negative reviews because he felt like he would learn something from it. So I know that the reviews on the film have been kind of mixed. Like, how, what do you read that stuff? You give a shit, like who cares? Like almost like the, you know, the Twitter mob going after Mel Gibson, which they're always going to go, they're never going to not go after him. Sure. Yeah. But like, I think just ignore them because Twitter doesn't represent the real world. I think everybody realizes that now. Right. Um, and there's, and there's, and there have been reviews that have gone after him, which is honestly what we've been focusing on is the people that are, are uh, supporting the film and digging the film because I mean, that's what's most important. Like, I, I don't know. There, I guess you want, you want to know what the, what some of the gripes are or whatever. Like, I think it's like, like, I can't believe you did this to my Santa kind of gripes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had one the other day that was like, there's too much profanity and we're like well this probably wasn't for you like it's an r-rated <laughs> movie and sure it listed that well, it's so violent and we're just like i know but I, i'm sorry like we made like you know that's the that's the santa we were after I, but i think look there's also people that wanted a total send up farce you know and we didn't we didn't set out to yeah. make that movie that was never the intent so i think there are people like us who really want a grounded gritty santa movie because we can't we can't do anything about the people who watch the movie and, and complain that we didn't make the movie they wanted us or that to they would have like, like, they would go have make that movie. you guys so i'm that. just you just cut you have to just kind of throw your hands up and be like okay well let's move on like let's move on to the one the people that either got it or have like a great criticism a great criticism we, we definitely read them yeah um yeah but it, but it is fun like it does seem to the people there are people like we all the other day was like this is my Santa Claus, you know, and that's <laughs> awesome. But people really like, or like not bad Santa, badass Santa. Like those are some fun. Those are some fun things, man. Like yeah, and then like I don't know, people are really, really digging the like really grounded vibe we had in there. They're like, oh, I, I went in thinking it was going to be this, but then like, oh my god, like I love this approach to Santa. And yeah, I think I think as soon as soon as you can 
get the idea that it's an adult Santa movie because I think the hardest connotation is to come in and be like, all right, I'm watching a Santa movie. Okay. And then you start watching and you're like, holy shit, this is like dramatic. Yeah. It's dramatic. It's a dark, dark comedy. It's like a dark comedy. And then it's like a thriller esque action element in there, you know? And if that's your bag, like this should be right up your alley. Yeah. And I, and I think people are really excited about Marianne also as Mrs. Claus. Oh, she was great. She was every time she turns up, and she was in that movie in uh, was it in fabric? I that seen was that. That yeah. Was fabric. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is a horror film about a killer dress. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome. The dress sort of um, actually is involved in in murders. It's oh, that's it's cool. such a great weird atmospheric horror film. It actually make a good uh, double feature with Fat Man. There we go. I'm down. I'm down with that. Fabric. Look that up. Um, Ian and Esham, thank you so much for being on the Film Threat Podcast. Congrats on Fat Man. Um, it's now, now it's one of those movies that every holiday, it's going to come around no matter what. I think it's, uh, that's awesome. Man, we appreciate it. Chris We've actually been much. big fans of yours, Chris, since uh, even since your festival book, man. That's what, one of the- Oh, really? That's oh, the shit. first book we ever started with was that festival book. Bought that book. And we used it. It was, uh, and we got into our first film festival back in '04, and we got our first review from one of your film threat folks. That was the first oh. review we ever got on any film we ever did. Now it wasn't a blazingly positive <laughs> review. It was a fifteen hundred dollar feature film, so you got to cut us a little slack. Exactly. They cut <laughs> us right. Slack. But but they were just like, holy, you know, it, it was it was a, it was positive enough. And uh, yeah, man, we I, we feel like we got some history with you and your site, man. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, we always we have a philosophy though. You can't judge you know, a small indie movie on the same level as a big budget feature, you definitely have to take into account like, like, um, you know, the fact that everything is against indie filmmakers. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, the fact that you've made it this far, uh, you should be really proud. It's, uh, One of my favorite things about your site back in the day, I don't know if you still do this, but you used to, like when we sent our DVD in, I mean, we were, a, like I said, a $1,500 film with no stars in it. And you got like on your site, it was like, Hey, Mail in your mail in your DVD, and I can't promise when the hell we'll watch it, but we'll be we'll watch it and we'll give it oh, a I star rating. Wow! And we sent it in, and you guys did, man. You put it up, and there was a review right there on the site that we were promoting, being like, "Hey, we actually got reviewed by a legitimate <laughs> reviewer." So you guys, well, are- I still do that. Actually, if you go to filmthreads.com, there's a little button that says submit, and you can submit your movie for review, like any movie. Like awesome. it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. like uh, you made whatever, um, send it to us and we'll review it. So we still do that. I will say we've got like 30 writers all over the world. And um, we, I, I don't know, we do our best to cover the indie film industry, but I was hoping your, I was hoping your, your run at distribution was going to keep going, man. You, you, God, what was the one with the, uh, it was like a DJ. It was like a monster and it took place in a DJ. I can't remember what the hell it was called, but man, there, you, you distributed uh, like a little horror film that was pretty great. Oh, uh, wow. We did a bunch like, of them like Necromantic by Jörg Budgeret, um, a German filmmaker. A lot of them. Yeah. No, we're, we're actually, uh, I mean, not like this is news or anything, but uh, we're actually looking at starting our own streaming service. So oh, that's awesome. We really? have a lot of indie filmmakers yeah. that want to, have us release their movies. I think physical media is really hard to make a go, but our own streaming service where you can like a lot of movies you can just watch and other movies you can kind of just like for an additional purchase check out. Like, so. I think that's a great idea, man. This is news. This is yes. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to line up the investors. You know what it's like. You got to hustle for years to make something happen. It's a marathon, baby. It is a marathon. You're tenacious. I know it's going to be great. All right. Well, uh, guys, it's great to meet you and chat. Uh, this is awesome. I have to thank our sponsor, actually, Storyblocks. Go to storyblocks.com slash film threat. They're a big supporter of us at Film Threat. Uh, great tools for for indie filmmakers. Um, guys, uh, this is awesome. when it's playing or anything. Sorry. What's that? Do we need to say when it's playing or anything like that? Or is that going to be? Oh, yeah. No. Uh, bad. Se- uh, bad what am I saying? Bad. <laughs> Fat Man is out. It is available. It is on video on demand platforms and in theater. Starting on the twenty fourth. Starting on the twenty fourth, it will be. Starting on the twenty fourth. It's it, but it's in theaters now and drive in. Yeah. Yes. Guess it's at, yeah. It's at one of the drive ins near me. So. Yeah. Awesome. That's, Where are you? That's great. Yes. Is so. It Vine, are you around that one? What's that? Are you around Vineland? Is that one close enough so to you? Vineland or? and the Mission Tiki. Those are the two I'm close oh, yeah. to. Nice so, man. Those. So yeah, Fat Man, get it. Thanks, uh, guys. 
gentlemen, thank you so much for doing the Film Threat Podcast. Uh, this is this is awesome. Have a good uh, have a good holiday, man. Thanks for having us. We're trying to make you it. proud. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, man.